Right. Well, so. it's a small group today. What's going on? Did I forget a <laughs> public holiday or something? <laughs> None that they know of. <laughs> I know what it is. I didn't put a reminder out. <laughs> well, welcome to New Tito. This is um how oh, nice the first paper's coming through. Uh, this is the classical group, I should say. Um, you know the drill, present a paper. I think we have two today, if I'm not mistaken. Have yes. A, yeah, but it's more science news than uh, a true like paper that I can go delve on and everything. Okay, so rule of the game is bring science that excites you. You don't yeah. have to justify. Or I know, I know. It's just that apologize I for your papers. I can't. Uh, um stretch the the time that i will present on too long because i can't just but the idea is to keep it short and sweet anyways <laughs> so that i can do I that i can do <laughs> um and there's another person in the crowd today that i know doesn't feel a hundred percent about the paper because it's an opinion piece rather than a scientific paper um but yeah, the, the whole idea is you take a piece of science that get you excited for whatever reason sure. you tell us why without having to worry about what you're bringing in the first place, okay? Sure. It's no wrong papers, just like there's no wrong questions. Right, we got three papers I can see now, so uh, we better crack on. Um, I know you sometimes ask me to, for order. Um, no one has done so today, so Brennan, Laura, do you wanna start? Okay, yeah, give me one second. Sure, the floor is all yours. Okay, so as Stephanie said, this is an opinion piece uh, that I read last week and uh, that I think tackles some interesting issue that we have in science in general. So we cannot do any type of research in humans and therefore we do, uh, we use other techniques in animals. Um, the problem is that when we do this, we have an explanatory gap that is given by the fact that we, with non-invasive techniques in humans, we achieve, we do research in animals, we can um, investigate phenomena at the microstructural level. Uh, but sometimes when we do this, we neglect what is going on in the rest of the brain. So what is something that is really needed is that we try to put together this information, although it's come from different spaces. Um, something that the authors propose, um, first of all, okay, yeah, something that the authors propose is that we can use um, three different approaches that uh, can allow us to do this uh, cross uh, species uh, analysis. Uh, but first of all, we need to consider the fact that although we have different brains in different species, there are some features uh, which are uh, preserved. Uh, for example, um, we have uh, preservation of uh, the structure and the function of the neural circuits and the encoded sequences within the human genome and uh, uh, in, um, in other mammals. For example, we have this 99% overlap between human and mouse. And this is also true for some patterns of gene expression. And we have a 79% overlap between humans and mice. So what the authors propose is that we use these uh, uh, three approaches, which are complementary, in order to put together the information that we get from different species. The first approach is that we should use different tools, but within the same species. Uh, for example, as we see here in mice, we can use uh, functional MRI, uh, and then uh, we can also use uh, electrophysiology. This is very important because it would allow us to compare the information coming from two different techniques. Um, for example, we could try to relate uh, the bold signal from fMRI to what is going on uh, at the neuronal level. Uh, then the second approach consists in using the same tools across different species. Um, this is a, um, a direct investigation of uh, what's going on uh, while, do, while doing uh, uh, a task in the two species in terms of activity. 
the problem is that we have different brains, so we should uh, try to create a, a common space um, with the use, for example, of landmarks, which can allow us to put together the information coming from the two species, but uh, in one same modality. And uh, then the third uh, approach that they propose is that we use the best techniques available uh, in each species, for example, MRI in humans, and then uh, electrophysiology in mice. And um, let's say that there are some measures uh, of the brain functioning that can be compared uh, between uh, um, the two modalities that we have. For example, uh, previous studies said uh, that uh, we have uh, these, um, these um, uh, oscillatory dynamics uh, that are recorded with MEG and that, are, uh, that can be possibly and directly related to in invasive measure of the local field potential. But another discourse is that um, it's more challenging to try to relate uh, non-invasive measurements that we have in humans uh, to uh, the real spiking activity or uh, synaptic processes that we have uh, uh, recorded. Is that uh, we should, uh, for the structural part, using some standardized templates in order to put together the information. And uh, then we should find uh, uh, an analytical framework which can be common for the data that we have. Something that has been done in the past was to use the representational similarity analysis to analyze data coming from uh, different species and from different techniques. So as you see here, we have uh, the same type of uh, stimuli which are presented to the two species in humans, uh, which are uh, doing an fMRI task. And then uh, in, uh, in mice uh, during electrophysiology, uh, they created these um, representational dissimilarity matrices. And then in this way, we can uh, try to understand which is uh, uh, the, the way in which the information is represented in the brain uh, in the two species. And uh, therefore we can see whether there are some uh, similarity in the way in which the information is represented uh, in humans uh, and in monkeys. Another, um, another thing uh, that they say could help us to put together and analyze information coming from the different species and different technology is uh, possibly computational modeling. Uh, they do this example of this algorithm that is called uh, temporal difference learning, which is based uh, on um, reinforcement learning algorithms. And basically, it says that the uh, prediction error signal is a good approximation for the temporal profile of activity in midbrain dopamine neurons recording using electrophysiology. But uh, let's say this is not the rule. So um, it's difficult to, to find an algorithm which is able to explain both the macrostructural and the macrostructural level of activity. And um, let's say I, I found this paper interesting, this um, opinion piece interesting, because um, it's a, a call for uh, an effort towards, um, let's say, uh, filling this gap that we have between species. And uh, I think it's very important. For example, in my experience, uh, when I, when I'm looking for stuff uh, regarding uh, uh, connections, uh, sometimes I read about um, tracing studies and I say, okay, this is awesome. But then when we come to putting together information and trying to understand what we can do about that piece of information uh, in respect to humans, uh, it's a bit tricky. And so, um, yeah. I don't know if you have an opinion on this. I won't be able to answer your question because I'm not uh, an expert, but uh, yeah. Hila, that very interesting paper. Um, any questions? No? Um, well, let's see if we can have a little discussion about this one because it's, it's quite interesting, um, I think. And the, there's really, two if not more problems here and one is the methods can we actually apply the same tasks across species 
Um, and can we expect the same behavior or neuronal activation patterns from the same tasks? And then the other, um, well, not problem, issue, whatever, point of consideration is um, what species is the best one to study? As in, can we assume that a mouse is close enough to a human for certain things, but not all things? Which monkey model is the best monkey model? Should we even use monkeys? Like this is this is a huge, huge bubble. Um, well, and then actually the third is how do we bring all these different type of methods together? So there's more and more push for multi-model uh, imaging and getting the best of each method and then try to combine it. But that in itself is difficult enough as a couple of you know firsthand in this audience. Um, but then trying to bridge that between species certainly does not make it easier. I see a lot of nodding and smiling. Any, any comments, any opinions? So for me, for what concerns the, the, the tasks, like trying to do the same tasks uh, in different species, uh, in, the, in this paper, they, this work, they also say that um, you can use, for example, virtual reality in order to do these uh, spatial navigation tasks and then try to understand whether these tasks leads to activation of something. They also do the example of uh, uh, play cells, which is something that uh, has been described uh, in different species. And uh, then one other thing I wanted to say um, is that something that I really agree on for this uh, work is that eventually what they call for is for a cross-validation of technologies to solve this problem. So uh, example, if we can have a uh, tractography in, in mice, and then uh, we can also have uh, tracing studies there, and uh, we have a real validation of the technique, and we can translate this to human without doing, of course, uh, tracing studies. But we have uh, we can understand the validity of the technique that we are using to a certain degree. It's a different anatomy. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, yes, if I can say, like when Laura was um, speaking, uh, I was thinking, why we are not doing this? This makes so sense. Uh, but maybe there are all the problems that Stephanie talked about. Uh, but probably we can uh, do more effort, as Laura was explaining. There are maybe some uh, way to merge this data. So yes, it was interesting. And yes, my question when uh, Laura was explaining is why we are not doing that. But uh, probably there are problems, I think. I never. Well, I remind you of a brain hack project that we did <laughs> a while ago, where we tried to combine all the different modalities. And you know how difficult that was. Yes, but at least. Uh, like for the MRI make something like uh, the most comparable as possible between uh, animals and humans that is something that can we achieve with all the limits of the techniques of course uh, that can we can have thing is Maybe. With, with MRI uh, there is a big component I think uh, with the human that is the comprehension of what's happening that you cannot have with animals Animals, you can only mm. at best um, make them used to the machine, the noise of the machine and the restraint that you have to put them in. But it is inherently very different uh, from how a, a human will perceive the, the whole thing. So okay. I think, I, I, I mean, for a very specific task, it might be ignored, might, but... Uh, I think it's it's a very big caveat uh, and this kind of uh, translational stuff with the MRI. Maybe it's not, but I, I doubt it. Uh, Ma'am, I just want to ask this. It, it also depends on the kind of question you are asking, right? Uh, because if you are focusing on the visual areas, for example, where they investigated initially uh, uh, in cat brain, uh, the 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 uh, 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 synchronization of patterns of uh, firing uh, of neurons in a specific area of P1, uh, which could be also translated to uh, a human being. 
facts, correct? So it really depends on what kind of mm -hmm. questions you're asking and uh, the similarities between the uh, between the animal in investigation and uh, uh, the brain of that particular species uh, and humans, right? Uh, not really. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, we if we we are thinking about uh, uh, advanced level uh, uh, processing in the brain, then certainly the kind of question uh, the comparison would be diff difficult. But uh, processing such as visual and auditory or uh, um, uh, uh, similar kind of investigations maybe think, yeah there is that a... automatic uh, automatically processed by the the brain you mean and that doesn't require a specific yes state high of level brain. of processing that's correct uh, mm -hmm. so it uh, depends on what kind of question we could ask and translate it uh, 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 across species right sure the other thing um to consider is that <clears throat> an mri scanner is far from a natural environment and while it's easy to get, well, within reason, relatively easy to get humans into an MRI scanner, um, if you want to do similar tasks with any kind of animal, then it, it's a matter of training. And you might be looking at years of training here, um, which certainly doesn't make it easier. And again, slightly less comparable. Wow. Thanks for the discussion. There's no further comments, not that I can see. Um, let's move on to the next paper, uh, Victor. All right, um, let me share my screen. It's, uh, it's a piece of news, uh, science news that uh, I've seen uh, quite a bit in different uh, science alert and everything uh, this, uh, this last week. Uh, it's not actually such a big deal, but it's, uh, it's quite interesting if you are into, like me, if you are like, into uh, uh, space uh, stuff and astrophysics and, and the like. <laughs> so this is about uh, axions. So just to, to introduce a bit of the principle, um, there are some problems with the, um, the, 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 the model of uh, how particles, uh, subatomic particles work uh, that have uh, different solutions. And one of them is the existence of a theoretical particle that we, don't have, we haven't detected yet that uh, solves a lot of those problems. And it calls, it's called a, an axion. Um, and the thing is, it's also one of the candidates for uh, dark matter. I don't know if you, if any of you are familiar with dark matter. Uh, it's uh, all right. So just to, to recap for the, those who would not be at least on YouTube or anything, it's um, when the astronomers look at the sky uh, and how uh, the objects in, in the sky, like stars and galaxies, and the clusters of galaxies, uh, how they behave, they see that there is a lot of mass missing. Like they, they see an, a gravitational pull of something that they cannot see and that they cannot explain only with the uh, normal matter than they uh, usually um, uh, look at. Normal matter is everything that is composed of uh, proton and neutron electrons, like what we call matter usually. And since they can't explain it uh, with this matter, they, they say that they, 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 they are, there has to be uh, another kind of matter that we don't know of that does not interact much with, um, with the, the normal matter. So we can't see it. And so they dubbed it uh, dark matter because we can't see it. So basically, and so, these axions that are the um, uh, that, are, that is a solution for another for another physics problem uh, can fill the gap because they would very weakly uh, interact with matter and there would be a lot of them, uh, so it would work. So this is the basics of where we were, and um, there was recently. The thing is with axions is that they can. If they exist, 
they would be produced by uh, neutrons smashing into each other. Um, uh, they have a very uh, special um, uh, property is that if they are under a very strong magnetic, uh, in, in a very strong magnetic field, they can transform directly into photons, like uh, X-rays photons. So this is something that is uh, one way to find these, uh, these axions would be to have a very strong magnetic field and look at uh, inside if you see like photons like popping up from seemingly nowhere. So there are experiments that are trying to do that uh, on Earth, but uh, with the kind of instrument we have, we uh, either they do not exist or it's, they are not sensitive enough. So for now, nothing has been detected. But this uh, paper uh, argues about uh, another source of uh, those X-rays that we uh, that might be uh, due to axions. So it's focus. It's focusing on the um, on two neutron stars uh, that are relatively close by from uh, an astronomical point of view, uh, and that are uh, studied by astronomers. And uh, those two, um, those two neutron stars. Uh, so, because they are mostly made of neutron, they can we, we, just with uh, the normal uh, heat inside of them, there will be a creation of. Well, if they are axions, there will be creation of axions inside of the neutron stars, and a lot of them. And also, neutron stars have this extremely powerful uh, magnetic field. So. When you we get the, the two together, you say, okay, it's perfect. It's a, like a, the perfect way we can detect axions because it creates a lot of them and it has a magnetic field that would transform them uh, into light. And so in theory, there should be more X-rays coming from, um, from neutron stars than what we expect from our models. And this is exactly what uh, these uh, two, um, uh, the stunitron stars that are being looked at uh, have. They have an excess of hard X-rays uh, that is not, that the, the astrophysicist cannot explain by any of the, uh, the known uh, mechanism uh, to produce X-rays. So this is quite exciting, but this might be uh, a clue that indicates that axions do exist and that would be uh, great news. So this is what the paper is about. But uh, this is not at all like a proof because we are just saying, okay, there are X-rays coming from the stars and we don't know why they are here. And that would, it's, it would go in the, in the uh, right direction for this exotic uh, theory, but actually, we have no idea what's happening there. So we have to stay uh, cautious about this kind of results. But yeah, I mean, it's this kind of thing that you'll find in science reports and stuff like that, that are like, oh, we've got a new particle. Man, probably not. It's like aliens, but it's not aliens. It's a, uh, but maybe, maybe, who knows? And yeah, uh, well, for, for, to me, that is a bit of a, a space nerd. Uh, it's pretty exciting. So yeah, that's it. Thank you, Victor. Um, funny you mentioned the aliens because the way you described it, I had like aliens in my head as well. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I can see you definitely put your physics hat on uh, this morning. And I know the next paper is going along the same direction. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> so it's an interesting morning. It's like definitely out of our comfort zone. Um, now, I'm not a physicist by any stretch of the imagination, but when you said that um, you could you could test for it with a strong magnet, how strong does the magnet have to be? I'm assuming I, an MRI scanners aren't strong enough. Uh, no, I don't remember exactly the value, but it, it has to be very strong, uh, like uh, probably over uh, 10 Tesla or something. I don't remember the value. The thing is, you. You don't need to have like, well, the problem is 
you don't they don't know exactly what will the mass be of these axions and depending on their mass you might need a stronger magnetic field than what we have uh, in, on earth that we can uh, create so the experience that they made uh, for now on earth is like they have um uh, like neutrons in a in a room that they, they smash together a big wall that prevents anything from uh, going through it and at the other side like a tube inside they, they create a strong magnetic field and at the end of the tube a detector of x-rays an x-ray detector so in theory like you smash neutrons at some point they trans they, they go through the wall um, and they, they are the only thing that can go through the wall because they don't interact much with matter and then they enter the magnetic field, transform into light, and are detected. And with the magnetic field that they tested right now, it didn't work. Like nothing happened. So they are like, so it cannot be uh, up to this mass of the particle cannot be up to this mass. It has to be lower, a lower mass. But it's like it's just we don't still haven't detected anything with kind of uh, thing. To, uh, so I guess we don't have the magnetic uh, field uh, um, machine strong enough right now. You certainly look very excited about this. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Patrick, you are muted. I'm guessing that's for a reason. Yeah, um, I, I don't have any idea about physics either. So uh, I'm just, my, my questions might be like coming from a very naive standpoint um, or will be coming from that. Sure. Um, so when basically, I mean, I see the logic in just coming up basically with an unobserved um, feature or particle or, or whatsoever that solves the problems that we can't solve with the set of known particles or set of known features in, in general now. Yeah. Um, but there must be certain rules applied to to define such 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 particles right uh, um, yeah. because I, I can imagine like for for instance it, it needs to have a mass obviously probably not detectable but it needs to mm -hmm. have one we cannot just go with or, no. or how is that not necessarily actually okay. it's uh, it's way above my head too uh, but how the uh, the physics work is that they they have a problem and it's transformed into a, translated into a pure mathematics and they solve the equations and so they have usually a lot of different uh, possible candidates that could explain solution possible solution that could explain the uh, what they see and some are like yeah you have to have time reversal and stuff like that so they just like out of the door and then they are several that. Uh, are competing uh, and some have particles without mass uh, and sometimes you say okay if it doesn't have mass so it cannot have uh, it, it has to have uh, this kind and this kind and this kind of uh, of properties and then you test for the property those properties and it happens that sometimes you can rule out this solution and it's what's happening usually in this kind of physics It's you rule out more and more uh, solutions of your equations until you have some something very specific that you can test uh, and say okay we have the Higgs bosons it's detected it's his it has to be the Higgs bosons and you can say in the with the, uh, the in the CERN at CERN they, they detected it and everything and they, they know it's here but uh, for example, for some time, the, the neutri neutrino that is another very, uh, not that much uh, known particle, uh, but the neutrino was expected not to have mass. And in the end, uh, we found that uh, it could change uh, during its flight from one place to another. And to be able to change means that it has to have a mass for some reason, and so we have we had to come back to this, and we could, they had to recompute everything, and so that's yeah that they, it's usually like solutions to mathematical equations, and then you just try to uh, reduce uh, by testing reduce the different solution until you have one that is the only one possible, and you can test it uh, in like a particle accelerator and say okay this is it. 
Okay, okay, cool. Um, the, the reason I'm asking is yeah. um, because basically you need, in order to test it, you need to have at least some idea, right? What to expect. Yeah. Otherwise, you, you don't know when your, um, when your test will be significant or when your test will actually give you the proof that a certain particle you expect exists, right? Yeah. So I'm wondering to what extent then all these hypotheses or generally speaking, hypotheses may be biased by, by our expectations here. Um, similar as they can be in neuroscience uh, for that matter, where we can only, or we, we tend as humans group to, we, we tend to group observations by the categories and knowledge that we already have, right? So yeah. it's, if, I, if I don't know how a unique, or I expect that a unicorn particle exists, I expect it to have a horn, for instance, right? Because that's kind of my definition of what a unicorn particle would look like. <laughs> so in that respect. Um, I want to see that now, Patrick. <laughs> and well, it's, it's not yet tested. I'm putting it out there. I have a unicorn on my passport. I think I know the country. You need to start looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know yeah. what I mean, right? Yeah. And um, I, the thing is, uh, well, let, 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 let me finish here. Yeah? Uh, no, please. please okay. go ahead. The thing is, uh, you are exactly right. Uh, we, we can test, or, well, to know if a particle exists, we'll have to test and to, to have like definite answer for this. But how do we find candidates, you are saying? Like, uh, our, the way you find candidates is biased, for, obviously. And it is, completely. Uh, this is also why there are so many different theories about so many different uh, particles that could explain, for example, dark matter, or the, like, the, the string theories and everything. It's something that is uh, really not, um, it's usually people, they, they are playing with the math uh, that are underlying the, all, the whole problem and they find a solution that is, that they find uh, beautiful or elegant and they say, this must be it. Mm. So, yeah. Because it's so beautiful and elegant that it would solve and hence it has to be that. I, I don't want to to bash now on, on physicists or anything because I think it's amazing what they're doing. Um, but I'm just I'm just wondering like how how does it work and it's just interesting to to hear about it. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, if I can if I can say yeah, something it's like against you now, Patrick. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's uh, like perfect what you said, as Victor explained. Um, also, I wanted to ask uh, um, if this can be simulated, and you already explained that. Uh, so this uh, really makes sense. I just want to say that um, it's sometimes like what we say, like playing with mass or elegance, is uh, looking for a symmetry. So usually what, um, what I understood, uh, because I'm not an expert in this, but uh, what physicists uh, um, do is, uh, uh, so you have to have like a balance between things. So this is why like uh, mass can transform in energy and why you are looking about these particles that uh, uh, are not, you are not sure that exist, but you are supposing that they exist because you need to have a balance because we have a um, principle at the beginning of everything that you have to conserve energy. So, uh, so you have to transform in something if this energy suddenly disappears. This is why we are thinking that the dark matter exists because you have something that uh, if you say two plus two, is uh, three plus one. And uh, if you can see this one, you have to suppose what this one can be. They can be like an, an neutron, an axon, you don't know. And you simulate all these uh, scattering things because you want to find this solution. So it's not that they are like um, invent, like yeah, of course uh, with the mass, uh, you have to try to find a solution. So everything is behind the symmetries. I, th I think, and uh, so um, I don't know if this can ask of some of the question, but uh, I think uh, um, this is the principle, yeah. 
And uh, if I can say, like, I really like that um, in this in the article that uh, Victor explained, uh, you have uh, some hard X-ray as uh, like uh, uh, something that uh, came up in the, this process, and maybe this can have applications in uh, uh, the medical field. Let's think when you want to treat a tumor, uh, you have accelerators of carbon protons uh, or. Uh, because you need like uh, a lot of energy. I don't know if we can see, I'm asking to you, Victor, if we can see some application of this or we are uh, far behind uh, of the, from this. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think there will be application of this exactly, mm. <laughs> to be honest, because it's already extremely hard even to produce those uh, this way. And we have way easier way to produce X-rays, but yeah, mm. I guess. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe like colliding <laughs> neutrons. <laughs> For now, yeah, axions, so we don't even know if they exist. So uh, let's not get uh, excited too much about it. <laughs> mm -mm. Okay. What but I was you. thinking is if it's mathematically beautiful or if it's, uh, 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 it's certainly a model, right? One of the models, a uh, the, uh, theoretical model. If it's mathematically beautiful, it doesn't really uh, imply that it has to be true, correct? It's true. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, 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 I certainly respect physics, physics and the work that physicists are doing. It's one of the best sciences we have. And uh, 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 in terms of accuracy, we have gained a lot. Uh, and we have understood nature much more uh, in terms of uh, physical sciences. Uh, uh, and I'm sure, like how we said that maybe Higgs doesn't uh, exist, and we now know that it does, but does, it doesn't really say that, okay, if we presume or uh, uh, reach to a particular uh, conclusion that a particular uh, uh, a particle exists, uh, it, uh, it has to exist. Uh, it is not necessary, right? Uh, and, and what I'm also trying to relate it to is uh, our understanding of uh, consciousness and how far, like uh, uh, we certainly are very good in predicting particles and trying to find out the particles. Uh, uh, you know, although they are so difficult uh, to really derive, derive mathematically and formulate a uh, a theory behind it, but we are, uh, uh, how far are we in terms of really understanding the problem of consciousness? And because we do have so many theories about it, right? Uh, like, uh, 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 which try to explain, okay, it, it, is, uh, 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 it is interaction and many, many different uh, ways uh, has been uh, 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 predicted, but we really don't know what it is. So how uh, how far is physics? Uh, uh, I mean, how far is neuroscience in terms of predicting what uh, consciousness can be? And uh, uh, in comparison to what physics is doing right now, that is uh, predicting uh, the laws of nature. I think they are pretty close, but we are still, although it's uh, there with us and we are thinking at, at, at every point of time and investigating, there are millions of people who are investigating, but still we don't know much about consciousness. So I just was trying to relate it to yeah, yeah, I, I see. Uh, our field here. So how far are we uh, uh, think, compared to physics? Yeah, I think it's hard to, to really compare because uh, and on the one hand, in on the study of consciousness, it's more like we have a problem of defin even of definition exactly what is consciousness. Here in physics, it's more like we oops or ah, I see your point actually. Uh, it's like we have something that we don't we, we can see, and we don't know how to explain it. And yeah. ah, yeah, I see. I, I I just like this example. I really like it because. The thing is that um, that typically when we're talking about psychology or neuroscience, and we're talking about it with like biologists or physicists, 
that they used to give us the this this label of not being a hard natural science, right? Whereas, well, yeah, we we still need to define to some extent our axioms on which neuroscience is based on or psychology is based on. But well, at least we're not there that we come up with things just to prove our theories. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, I mean, they come up with a lot of stuff, but then they have to prove they are right. And that's the hard yeah. part. In, in psychology, uh, we have a couple of unicorns in psychology as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Um, lovely discussion. I hate to interrupt you at this point, but we have one more paper. Sure. Um, that falls into a similar category in terms of physics and theory. So Leah, if you're ready, take it away. Yes, so can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, uh, so also this is a, a paper published uh, like three, year, three days ago uh, in uh, Nature Physics. So is um, about a physics background, but um, what I always want to do is trying to find an application of all these uh, uh, knowledge or mathematical uh, uh, tricks uh, formulations that we have uh, in physics. I'm really interested in the translation to uh, something that can really be useful. Uh, for example, uh, uh, imaging applications, uh, and uh, this is uh, like <laughs> a little bit of my story, but I uh, was in this uh, uh, paper, uh, they are trying to do that. Uh, so um, it's called maximum information state for current, uh, uh, current scattering measurement. So they are trying to um, simulate and formulate uh, what is happening in a scattering process and they used a new tool uh, that is the maximum uh, information state and uh, i really love the introduction because uh, they're trying to uh, do like a link be between uh, quantum physics uh, and so uh, the uh, uncertainty principle so you have always a limit in your resolution as you have in uh, uh, imaging and they are trying to find that limit, to reach that limit of resolution that uh, can be achievable. And to do that, uh, they proposed uh, um, some new, um, let's say, mathematical tools, uh, merging the Fisher information uh, that uh, uh, can um, like allow you to describe uh, the complexity of your system and some uh, uh, operators that let's say we can think from quantum physics and uh, in particular uh, an Hermitian operator that is again something that wanted to describe these uh, symmetries that we have in this uh, uh, mathematical description let's say and um, for example here they um, try to uh, uh, tangled through situations where you have a scattering medium and you have uh, something that you don't know that is this uh, theta, this uh, angle, and uh, you want to, to try to have the um, optimal estimation of that. And you can do this, for example, uh, finding the best shape, shaped wave that uh, uh, collide with this uh, uh, scattering material. And uh, this is uh, one of the approach that they proposed at the beginning, and they uh, resolve this using uh, uh, this uh, information, feature information description of what is in and what is out and the system. So you are trying to describe a process here. Uh, that is something that uh, actually you usually have in imaging that uh, you want to detect something and there is uh, uh, a probe that can be light, uh, MRI field, uh, uh, something that uh, collide with this system. So they, are, they formulated this new um, framework to answer to these questions that are uh, really useful in, uh, uh, for example, imaging applications. 
And uh, then they had another uh, sim situation that they wanted to try to resolve is uh, when you have something, an object that is hidden by a, a medium and you have a camera. I will show you the, uh, the image. So uh, you have an observer and uh, let's say that this is your camera where you detect your image. This is something that a diffuser, uh, so a material that is hiding an object. And you want to uh, predict this phase, this uh, phase uh, shifting that you have due uh, to this object. And they simulate different uh, situations where uh, you have, for example, an offset of this camera, uh, what you will see from the camera, or if you have uh, not a cross but a circle. So, um, so then what uh, uh, you will see. So this is the intensity. This is uh, uh, the Fisher information that uh, this is uh, this modeling of this uh, uh, image, let's say. And then you have this uh, uh, maximum information state that uh, you uh, uh, they applied. Uh, to this data and uh, um, they uh, see how uh, this uh, tool is responding in this situation. Here you can see that actually uh, you can, see, you can uh, see from this image what was behind the diffuser that is this cross. In this case you have the most sensitivity uh, in the middle of the cross. If you have this offset it seems to be more uniform they say because you have a different diffraction angle uh, of light. Uh, otherwise, if you have this circle, you have the most sensitivity just on one side of the circle. They say again that this is something that is expected. So, because uh, these methods are also um, have been applied, uh, for example, in a semiconductor, um, in other uh, field uh, in. Uh, um, in other field, so they are trying to translate this uh, in imaging. So they expect something, uh, they do not expect uh, uh, other aspects. So it seems that uh, here, uh, I know that when I saw this uh, image, I said, uh, yeah, you can't really see the cross maybe here, but uh, you are seeing something that is hidden. So I was thinking maybe let's uh, say, because this can be applied to any kind of, of electromagnetic fields. For example, do you think like in um, uh, echo imaging, let's say if you have like a sonar probe, an acoustic probe that, uh, uh, what maybe you can uh, with this modeling you can see something that is hidden so in a layer in more depth so there can be some application of this uh, uh, I think and uh, then here uh, there was another example where when they show that this maximum information state can uh, uh, predict this uh, shift this uh, phi shift uh, in a better way that uh, um, you just uh, think which is the best plane wave that we can have in this scattering. So here you have like a, a more uh, a peak distribution of your most probable uh, uh, value. Here it's a little bit more uh, uh, messy. So um, yes, in this article they basically prove, try to prove to and translate to imaging these new uh, operators that you can uh, uh, borrow, let's say, from uh, quantum physics or um, uh, they say that we're applying in bioptical, biomedical optics. So they're trying to translate these in uh, imaging and um, I really like it because um, it's a way, uh, it's a new way of thinking that uh, at this stage maybe can seem like, uh, okay, a new method, something new, but maybe like uh, if they uh, pursue in this uh, um, research, maybe they can, uh, uh, we can have new information uh, from, an from an image that we already acquired or have some more information about how to uh, acquire in the best way this information and 
yes, there was like one sentence that I always loved that was from this board that we are suspending, uh, suspended on language. So what we see is actually the model that we are applying. And of course, every measure has a limit, but uh, if we, um, we have to reach that limit, and I really like this article because they also explain here in the introduction this concept. And uh, so I know that it's really physical, but applied to the, to the imaging uh, field, but uh, maybe a little bit far from MRI, but um, other uh, imaging maybe closer. So that was it. I don't know if you have any questions. Thank you, Leah. So I know you were super excited about this. Mm -hmm. you know? um, just to just to recap briefly. So there's a potential that we could push the boundary of resolution in MRI. Did I get this right? No, MRI is a little bit far. The, here they are talking about, about light fields, but uh, can be like electromagnetic waves, um, like um, uh, of different uh, lengths. So it can be like uh, with, uh, with the, the visual field, or also they say in the discussion that can be translated to ultrasound or uh, acoustic um, um, wavelengths. Um, so maybe uh, MRI, we are a little bit. Uh, far but uh, they they don't talk about them right now okay but it could it could find its application in imaging the brain one way or another mm, yeah okay um any questions um hi leah thanks for presenting hi. this um i'm i'm just wondering could you probably explain what, like there are several uh, differences obviously between MRI acquisition and other, uh, or biomedical optics, right? So could you explain what hinders the application of this method for MRI? So is it like the um, an hardware issue? Is it the difference in, in the outcome measure that we're actually having or, um, so um, the way I saw the link with uh, MRI, but I, I, um, I say again that uh, it's maybe the um, farthest application of this, uh, because uh, um, in uh, MRI we have a lot of uh, things going on when you, uh, for the, uh, like uh, let's say the association of the signal with the position, so there there are a lot of things uh, uh, there. So uh, maybe with MRI, it's something that's in the really um, uh, raw processing. Uh, I was thinking about the Fourier transformation. Maybe you can apply there some filters uh, that can uh, try to uh, just select these maximum information states. So it's something really at the beginning of all the process that uh, we're gonna have then for the MRI imaging. So um, I see maybe there an application of uh, that. So like, a kind of way like, uh, or like a, like, like a filter at the beginning where you have the, the, um, the, the signal, the, the wave that you acquired and maybe you can try with, uh, yeah, it's a kind of a filter to select which is the maximum information state and then process there in the uh, uh, MRI pipeline. I saw maybe there an application, but it's uh, an imagination. Uh, they are not saying that in this, uh, in this article. So, so it's not used or, or the idea is not to use it on basically spatial informed data or no, no, it's uh, related to spatial informed data because one of the um, point of the article is that they um, could uh, um, view, let's see, uh, something that was hidden by a diffuser uh, material, it says this here, and they just are proposing here a framework. So they just developed these mathematical tools and, and they uh, um, try to use these tools in the situation that uh, we uh, have seen. 
And so it's something really like uh, basic uh, uh, physics um, research. So uh, the possibility are uh, many, uh, especially in the imaging applications, as they said. Uh, but um, it's something at the beginning. We uh, it's uh, like they just uh, uh, propose this new way of. Uh, uh, analyzed uh, um, uh, waves, so uh, here light, but any kind of field. So it's, uh, uh, let's say, a new method that can have many applications. And uh, I don't know if I did, I did answer. I think you did answer pretty well, yeah. thanks. Okay. Um, Leah, just a quick question. Coming back to the nice figure they have in the paper with the cross and the circle, I didn't, the, the next one with the hidden layer, Here. yes, that one. So I didn't quite understand where we can more or less see the circle and as, uh, sorry, the cross and are sensitive to it, but the circle, I don't really see, mm -hmm. didn't get that part. Yeah, it's also, um, what, uh, yes, I was also like really excited at the beginning when I read the article and then, uh, um, yeah, this is the result for the star. So maybe here you have some pixels that are more, more sensitive. And they said that is normal to have, uh, um, uh, I don't know why, but uh, it's normal to have like uh, um, this maximum information on uh, uh, one side he that it has the mirror symmetry in the system is broken by the diffuser again the symmetries so they said that um, they something that they expect that you can see simultaneously both uh, edges maybe it's, I don't know maybe it's good because when you have like a phase shift sometimes there is an interference of this phase shift like we have uh, you know when you acquire an MRI you can have like a flip if your field is too, because uh, we are talking about waves. So mm -hmm. maybe if you have a shift that is the same, it's expected to flip on one side. Right. This is my uh, explanation on the fly, but uh, maybe that could be like this, because here we have like a symmetry and uh, we are talking about waves. So maybe there is uh, something like that. Thank you. Glad I'm not the only one who was puzzled by this one. Um, right, this is, we're on the dot. This is all we have time for this week. Um, thank you so much for bringing those interesting papers. Thank you so much for uh, discussions. Um, very physics heavy this morning, um, but I hope you um, have an exciting si a week and I can't talk today. I hope you have an exciting week in science. <laughs> um, and we see you next Monday, 9.30 with your new papers. Thank All you right. so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> bye. See you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.